Barry, thanks very much for joining me. We're going to be doing this on both of our platforms. So for people of mine, hello, everyone. It's Dr. Anthony Chafee with Plant Free MD. Today, I have a very special guest, Larry Allhands, who's a military veteran and has his own podcast and YouTube channel where he deals with issues de dealing with uh, the military and servicemen and women. Larry, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks, Dr. Chafee. Yeah, I have a podcast too called Mission Carnivore. And it is geared towards military veterans and first responders and mental health uh, and basically treating mental health with diet, basically uh, curing yourself of your ails <laughs> because the VA is terrible at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so good. So you, we were talking yeah. uh, a bit before, before we came on here about the prevalence and serious nature of the suicidality and how it's more, more recent than people may realize. And it's obviously much more dire than a lot of people recognize as well. Can you talk a bit about that and tell people yeah. what, what, the, what the problem is exactly? Yeah, sir. So we've been in a state of war since 2001 till recently. And over that time, we've had about 6,800 casualties, KIAs in both theaters, but we're losing over 7,000 veterans a year to suicide. So it's like one of those, basically it's two 9-11s every year. It's pretty crazy. And it's, it is a crisis, a healthcare crisis. And they've identified a lot of the issues that, and this is just veterans, not including first responders, because they have their issues as well. But there's a lot of issues that have been identified as possible triggers and causes, PTSD. But when you look at the numbers, what we find is there's no correlation between, say, deployed troops and suicide. There's actually a higher suicide rate at troops that never deployed than troops that have. Mm -hmm. So not that PTSD doesn't necessarily uh, contribute to it, but it's definitely not the primary driver. There's been a lot of studies doing, there's a great video with Professor Chris Palmer. He's got a TEDx video you can check out where he talks about that. And I think a lot of the issues that we see come from the warrior culture where you, you suck it up and you drive on, you basically you overcome your issues and you don't ask for help. And that's the way first responders, law enforcement, a lot of people in these theaters just look at the guys to the left and right they're doing it so i need to do it and they just drive forward and because people don't ask for help they internalize a lot of this stuff and we found that there's a lot of issues they've actually found that do drive uh, or do are present in these suicides and the kind of things they found are like relationship issues financial issues legal issues and of course, self-medication issues where people are medicating. So there are issues that they do find that correlate to suicides, but surprisingly, it's not just deployments. Because whenever I tell someone, yeah, I did, I, I served 20 years, I retired as a chief warrant officer. And whenever I talk about suicide, they're like, oh yeah, what these people saw must be doing it. And when you think about it though, yes, they may see and do and be involved in a lot of horrible things. But if you look at first responders, your typical ambulance driver, your paramedic, they're going to see a lot more volume of trauma on a daily basis for a whole career and maybe law enforcement and nurses and, and doctors too in emergency rooms. So there's that exposure everywhere. So something else is driving this besides just that exposure definitely contributes, but I don't think it's the active driver. Yeah. And you, you were saying too, that in, that this level of suicidality is, is a more recent phenomenon as well, that we've had this shock and trauma from war. We've had wars immemorial and looking at things like the world war one the war to end all wars that absolutely just shocked the world because it was the first time we had mechanized warfare people taking flamethrowers through trenches and just torching people alive and mustard gas and all these sorts of things we didn't have the geneva convention they had bayonets that were a triangle shape that they could right. stab people with and this was purely because it would cripple them so if you didn't yeah. kill them it would have a, a horrible healing scar and wound that would plague them the rest of their life. And so that's illegal now. Look, you can't do that. You're going to kill someone, yeah. fine. You don't cripple them for the rest of your life purposefully so that even after the war, they're suffering. And, but World War I was, it was, and before the Civil War in America, that was tragic. Cannons full of metal chips and nails and things like that. And they'd blow this cannon off and just shrapnel would just shred the first four lines of the advancing troops. So people have seen horrible things, horrible things, and been involved in pretty much pretty disastrous campaigns. 
but you were saying that they didn't have the same suicidality at that point. Is that right? Yeah, the suicide rates have really ramped up. I think we really started noticing it probably after Vietnam in the 70s, late 60s, 70s. And then it's just ramped up since then. And that that tells me something else was introduced to the equation too that added to it, not necessarily because I, I think this underlying damage to the psyche has been there this whole time, obviously, and the trauma and the mental stress. And people have always had problems with relationships and money and legal issues. Those are not new. These have been around since man has been around and since society has been around anyways. My theory is that our standard American diet has introduced a lot of things that have changed the way our brains work. I know because my personal experience with becoming a carnivore, I've been a carnivore for 186 days now, and my whole mental fog went away, depression went away, uh, anxiety levels dropped to being gone, and my stress levels even dropped where I don't get angry when I'm driving in traffic and such. It's amazing to me that all this was there, and I didn't even realize it because I was just living with it for my whole life. And then when it's gone, you can realize, wow, the potential is amazing. So I just think that maybe that our diet, adding all these processed foods and low fat diet and all the things we did wrong, thanks to Ansel Keys and his cohort. But anyway, because of that, we've actually introduced a lot of things that are causing people not to be able to deal with issues. And it's compounding the, the problem we have and resulting in higher suicide rates. So I think that talking about diet, it's something, here's something else, the uh, military guys, and I'm sure law enforcement, same and firefighters and such, we don't like to go to people for help because we're trained not to, we're trained to like, suck it up and drive on. So if we can offer something they can just do themselves, they don't have to be public about it. Even. They're just like, Hey, I'm just going to fix this. Cause I identify the issue. It, I think it can definitely appeal to a lot of them where they don't have to go to a doctor. They don't have to go get counseling or see someone. They can say, let's, you know, first thing, let me fix my diet and see if this changes things. I think that's a big deal. Now, like I said, all those factors are present during these suicides, uh, but the number one cause of the suicides, according to the army, is untreated depression. So the depression is there. I've had it. Most people I know have had it at some time. And I can tell you this diet, carnivore diet, definitely changes that for sure, 100%. And it's definitely some kind of chemical imbalance has changed, or I don't know, you're the brain doctor, you'll know more than I do, but I just know that it does work, right? It, And it's not just me, because uh, other veterans who I've talked to tell me the exact same thing. It's not, like, oh, it's just me, I'm lucky. No, every veteran I've talked to that's done this has seen a complete change in their outlook on life, their motivation, their depression going away, anxiety going away. It's all very standard. Yeah. So you mentioned Professor Chris Palmer from Harvard, and, and he wrote a book called Brain Energy, and he theorizes that most, not all, mental health issues actually come down to a metabolic disorder where your mitochondria aren't working properly and they're not making energy properly. But that's the that's only one small part of what the mitochondria do. That's what we're taught. The mitochondria are the, the generators of cells, but they don't just sit there just pumping out ATP, right. which is the energy currency of cells. They move around. There's this internal cytoskeleton inside cells, and there's these little bridges and lines and things like that, that all the organelles can stick to and move up and down on. And the mitochondria are zipping around like blue bottom flies, just zipping around all the time. And there's hmm. thousands of these things. And depending on the cell type, it, it can have several thousands, hundreds of hundred thousand or, so, or something like that as well. So th there are a lot of these things and they are, they really are running the the cell there's like like sailors on a ship they got on the old school on any ship modern or past with going up riggings and pulling things and grabbing things and going over here moving and physically steering right. the ship and making it work and so they they move around to a, a certain area they'll move to this organelle and they'll release atp so that organelle can have energy so that it can do work so that it can have a function then it goes over to this other thing how the hell they know this i have no idea yeah. it's just from chemical interactions and reactions it's pretty amazing life is amazing it's just how it works it's incredibly complex and this is one of the more complex parts but people think everything's down to dna dna doesn't run the show dna are the blueprints and then the mitochondria are the architects and the construction workers that are using the blueprints to go and actually action things out and do something with it. 
And so if those are a bit damaged and they're a bit sluggish and they're not able to produce as much energy, they're getting there a bit late or maybe a bit early and they're releasing the wrong amount of energy. They're getting the wrong amount of signal at the wrong time. Hmm. And if you're doing that for thousands of mitochondria in trillions of neurons, that compounds very quickly when you start damaging these things. So nice. all of a sudden you're not getting the proper brain signals. You're not getting the proper neurotransmitters sending out at the right time, which then the next one gets a delayed response. And then it has a delay on propagating that response. And so there's this knock on effect because your neurons are constantly talking to each other and interacting with each other. So one neuron could interact with 10 to 30,000 other cells, right? And so that slowing or maybe even speeding up and doing something, but either way, the wrong timing of those signals and getting the wrong signal strength is now getting sent to 20,000 other cells, which now send off the wrong signal at the wrong time and the wrong strength. And it just causes merry hell. And then people are just like, I don't feel well, this isn't right. This isn't as much, and then, or having hallucinations or becoming bi bipolar or having OCD or major depression and, and all these sorts of things. But Professor Palmer is showing that you can actually reverse things right. like major depression and even schizophrenia by putting people, well, just by fixing their metabolism and doing things to address their mitochondrial metabolic health, first and foremost, being changing the hell out of their diet and getting this garbage that damages your mitochondria, that damages your metabolic health, getting that, getting rid of that and putting people on like a ketogenic diet or carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet, if, or it should be anyway. And they are finding that this well, we have studies showing that after a few months on a, on a, uh, any ketogenic diet, where you just, your insulin drops down low enough that you can go through autophagy or mitophagy. And that's a concept that's probably good to touch on. Autophagy is when your body recycles older cells that aren't really working too well, but it can actually replace the inner parts of a cell as well. The organelles inside the cell, like the mitochondria, and that's called mitophagy. So phagy is just eating right? So that you have like a macrophage, this is a big cell that eats other cells. And so mitophagy is when your cell basically just recycles your mitochondria and just dumps it through a little blender, spits out the little amino acids, constituent parts, and then use those to make a new one that's running better and uh, is newer, faster, stronger. And it also promotes the production of more mitochondria. So after a few months on a ketogenic diet, you have four times the number of mitochondria and they're four times as effective. So you get a massive in increase in uh, metabolic function and in, in mental health as well, as seen by uh, Professor Chris Palmer at Harvard. And he's doing studies right. in humans and showing that you can reverse schizophrenia, major depression, all these other sorts of major things by addressing these metabolic underlying conditions. And I misspoke earlier because when I was talking about Chris Palmer, he didn't have the TEDx talk. He had the interview with you. Oh. And that's what drove me towards this. That's what kind of fueled okay. my theory when I saw you interviewing Chris Palmer. The Richard Doss had a TED talk about uh, soldier okay. suicide. It's really good. So check that out if you haven't. But yeah, Chris Palmer, your interview with him, that seeded my theory starting. I was like, okay, if all this can be reversed on these people having bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, which is normally a death sentence. There's no real good answer. There's drugs that make you feel terrible and or there's being schizophrenic and not being on these drugs. So there's no answer. But if, when I saw that, wow, if that can be reversed, then our symptoms are, are bad, but they're not terrible, but they're enough where when you get these other things introduced, relationship issues, money issues, it can tip you over the edge, especially when you have no one to go to because there's a stigma. Because if you're in the military and you go say, listen, I'm having suicidal thoughts, guess what? Your career is not going to be great going from there probably because you get identified and then they say, no, it's not the way, it's not the case. It's just, it's, people can say what they want, but once you've been tagged of having mental issues, mental health, if you go seek mental health care and you're carrying guns in the military, it's a red flag. That's just the way it works. And no one wants to be that guy. You don't want to be that guy that lets other people down or that girl. You want to be that guy that can be counted on. It's like play, playing rugby. You don't want to be the rugby player that gets injured and has to leave a game ever. Because what I'm, when I played, we only had one injury substitution in the game. That was it. And you never want to be that guy. You played hurt. And then you until you were 
a detriment to your team. So same kind of thing. Yeah. So anyway, I just want to correct that. Like I said, we're, we're not really good at asking for help in the military. And that's, there's reasons it is. And, and I'm sure in law enforcement. Now, here's interesting. I actually worked in law enforcement from 2000 to 2005 after I got out of the military my first tour. Uh, and I worked as a computer specialist, but I worked with the police very closely because I was, I set up their 911 call system, their new computers. And I also set up a tactical mobile basically a SWAT van that we'd roll, that we'd had hostage negotiation team. I'd set up all their comms and make sure everything was good and record all the stuff. So I worked with them a lot and I was on a lot of SWAT calls, which is cool. But one thing I noticed in law enforcement is that there was a shooting and someone was killed. Everyone involved in that shooting, the next couple of days in our department was put on a leave and got counseling right away. And I'm like, that's proactive. That's real. And in the army, they don't do that. That's, they can't, Cause you can't like, all right, your platoon standing down. We're going to go give you, no, we're going on patrol. We're taking care of business. That, that's not the way it works. You, you, we don't have that luxury that you have in law enforcement. And so I think they treat that really well. And that's probably a good model. I know when I was leaving and, and so a lot of other triggers for suicide with military and law enforcement and probably firefighters is retirement. That's one of the, cause you're going from, or, or separation of service or retirement. When you're going from one day being part of a team being, and you probably went through this when you left your rugby team or part of a unit and you go out and you're on your own next and you lose all those. I mean, they're there, but you don't have the same contact with them daily. And especially in the military, when I separated first, they give you like a two week, how to write your resume thing and how to apply for jobs. And then goodbye, good luck and check the VA and make sure, and you go out and you're just on your own. And that feeling of separation, it's really easy to self-isolate and self-medicate and do these kind of things. So I think those contribute as well. There's all kinds of contributing factors, but all those contributing factors on their own without the diet issues, like you're saying with the brain malfunctions going on, being a signal officer, I appreciate signals going on time and being orderly because if they're not, our systems break. We have GPS satellites timing our signals between switches because they have to be able to speak at the right time and listen at the right time. For this, like this call that's going on, we're going across satellites and cross continents. And this requires absolute perfect timing to make it work. We just take it for granted. And we take it for granted for our brain too. But like you're saying, maybe this cloud, this fog we're building by damaging the mitochondria is contributing to this, the suicide rate. I really think it might be. I, I think so. And I think that obviously there are, there are a lot of things that can contribute, but a lot of these things that are contributing, especially the substances that we put in our body, they damage your, your mitochondria and they damage your metabolism. And obviously you can become uh, dependent on different substances and make yourself feel better in, in other sorts of ways. And you withdraw from them and you feel worse and all these sorts of things compound that as well. But a lot of these things damage your mitochondria, they damage your metabolism. And that's how doing this long-term can make your situation worse and worse and worse and worse. And so it's really a good idea to get far away from those sorts of things. And while you may feel better short term for having self-medicated with alcohol or whatever, you are yeah. making yourself feel more hopeless and miserable long term because you are damaged, you're further damaging your mitochondria and, and the health of your brain and these healthy signals that are being sent off. And you're damaging dopamine production and now you're getting you're ramping up your dopamine and now you're becoming insensitive to dopamine. Now you feel really bad as well during your, just your normal day. So it can be quite, quite a slippery slope. You start going down that path. It can just get worse and worse. And speaking of slippery slopes, the VA is being a government agency and our healthcare and the military, they go directly by the guidelines of whatever the government says, right? So they're not going to vary at all. In fact, if you don't want to take a prescription, when they say you need to take one, they make you sign a waiver saying you're supposed to be taking you're not but so if you go there guess what they're going to give okay let's say i go to the va and say listen i'm depressed guess what's going to happen they're going to give me drugs right they're going to medicate me and this happens or i have ptsd or whatever i'm going to take i'm going to take drugs and then i start getting symptoms so i go back hey i got these weird symptoms oh yeah that's one of those drugs here take this drug now because that's going to fix this symptom and before you know it i know guys that have nightstands full of pill bottles and they're all treating it's a cascade and they're treating symptoms are not fixing the issue. When I knew someone that went on those drugs once, I was like, what's the diagnosis and what's the plan to fix a, the problem? Because this is treating symptoms, not the problem. So what's the diagnosis and what's the plan, right? And there is none. 
That's not the way it works. So this is yeah. also contributing. It's a slippery slope, either self-medicating or even going into the VA and getting professionally medicated by them. The same thing, same results, probably worse. Yeah, yeah it's called a prescription cascade. And that was something that they specifically warned us against in medical school. Don't do that. And if you see a patient come in that is on 17 different medications, try to figure out why the hell they're on them and why, you know, do they right. need to be on them? And try to, it all leads back to this one medication that, that had this side effect, but this side effect and that side effect and this other side effect. And if you can just fix that one and either change the dose or change the medication to get the same effect and result, but without all the cascade of problems after that's what you do. And that, so that's what we're supposed to do. It can be difficult. It can be, maybe you weren't trained like that to think like that. And maybe you just don't think in that manner, but the drug companies, they're on the other side of that. So there's a whistleblower that came out and they said that this is all very corrupt. And these people are not trying to help us. The people in the food and drug companies are not there to help us. They are there to profit from our misery and suffering. And he said that He's in a conversation with a, a pharmaceutical executive. I'm, I'm really having trouble remembering who the hell this was. But in any case, he said that that he was talking to this executive and the executive said, do you know what my favorite drug is that our company produces? And they were like rose colored glasses is oh, something that helps children and cancer and all <laughs> that sort of stuff. And I was like, no, my favorite drugs that we make are the ones that cause side effects right. that you have to get, use other drugs that we make to correct. Those are my favorite drugs. And I think if I was in the room with him, I probably would have knocked him out. I don't know how I, <laughs> that's I, pretty bold. I would stop myself. That's pretty bold. Yeah. It's pretty disgusting. Like what the hell is wrong with you that you would, that you would feel that way about, about other human beings. This, the pharmaceutical companies have the ability to help billions of people and they have in a lot of ways, but that is wrong. And that's a corruption of, of mind that really has no business being in the healthcare uh, industry. Think about this. It's like firefighters get paid by the job. And so they go out and make work for themselves. That's right. not good. <clears throat> that's not a good paradigm. And, and in fact, I had friends who were seasonal firefighters in Arizona, and this was 20 some years ago. This was in the early 2000s. It probably was, yeah, early 2000s. And they were saying that if you were low down on the pecking order, you get called up on, on a demand basis. And so if there weren't enough fires that year, you wouldn't get brought up, but you've already bought the $45,000 truck and, and the <laughs> mortgage that you can't really afford because you're expecting another 40, 50 grand to come in that summer from doing seasonal firefighting. And so they're like, I'm going to miss my mortgage payments. I'm going to have my truck taken away. And he was saying, I don't. That's just from what he was saying was that people would actually go out and start fires themselves in order to have more demand and, and be able to get called in. And that's what, what these drug companies are doing. You're, they're causing a problem right. so that they can be paid mm -hmm. to address that problem. And that, that is, mm -hmm. that has no place in modern society. They don't have to uh, take any Hippocratic oath there. So they're on the, they're ancillary on the side there. Just, oh, we're not going to take an oath not to do harm, but we're just going to sit here and make money while people, while we do harm, right? And they're like one step removed yeah. from the cartels, oh, literally. They are tar cartels. This is yes. legalized cartels. Exactly. 100%. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I totally agree with that. Yeah. So I don't take any drugs at all other than to leave occasionally. And I don't even take any sinus pills anymore now that I've been on carnivore because I lost 45 pounds. I'm feeling athletic right. again. I put on muscle in six months is crazy. I don't take mm -hmm. allergy pills anymore. I used to take them every day. I have probably a lifetime worth of allergy pills now because I used to buy the big bottles from Costco. They're like hundreds of pills. That's going to last me 50 years. I never got to go there and buy another allergy pill because I've only taken, I think, one allergy pill in the last six months. And it's ridiculous. The money they were making on us on all the stuff I have in there, I'm about to clean that cabinet out pretty much. I've been keeping it just in case. I'm like, I never know. What if, but there's a bunch of supplements in there. I don't need to take anymore. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. So yeah, I just think that if we get this message out to veterans and law enforcement and firefighters and paramedics, I've got an interview with a paramedic tomorrow. You actually interviewed with an intentional carnivore. 
Yeah, I'm interviewing him tomorrow because he's a paramedic. So we're talking carnivore tomorrow. He's going to be on my podcast. And Sean White, great guy. Yeah, yeah I'm, and not all the guys I'm interviewing have YouTube channels or podcasts. A lot of them are just vets. And I'm just like, hey, I'd like to hear your story. Like the other vet I interviewed the other day was George Goodenough from the UK. He was a proud Intel corporal for the uh, Desert Rats in Desert Storm. And he actually contracted uh, Desert Storm Syndrome, which is, was a strange disease that no one really knows what caused the disease other than he just have all these weird symptoms. And so they can't really pin down what causes some thought it was nerve gas or burn pits and, right. or maybe the shots they had to get to go overseas because there's new, a lot of experimental vaccines used when they went overseas. He did, he started this 18 months ago and he reversed type two diabetes, lost 90 pounds. I think, and then he, all his Gulf War syndrome symptoms went away and he's wow. back to, yeah, a hundred percent. And what he said was, I love this. He said, he walked into a pub and a mate of his was there and said, George, you're back because yeah. he recognized <laughs> he, he'd been gone for all these years, but he's back now yeah. because of this diet. And of course his mental health's better because it does beat up on you when you're not old yet. Like I am, I'm 57 and I, I just started deteriorating. My PT tests after I turned 50 got really hard. I retired at 53 years old and I was really hard to maintain my weight and my physical capability. And the last year I basically didn't, I couldn't make mm -hmm. standard even, but I tell you what, listen, today I went out in the 93 degree heat at lunch and did five 50 meter sprints uphill with 10 pushups. Each one so I did 50 pushups and sprints. And I feel like an athlete again. It's amazing. There is no joke on this thing. So I think if you get these veterans who are in crisis and these law enforcement first responders that are suicidal in crisis and you fix their diet, man, we're gonna have a superhuman army out there of people that can basically return to life and, and they're, they'll be back like George was, they'll be back. And that's yeah. what I'm shooting for with mission carnivore. If even one person gets that out of mission carnivore, then my, my mission's accomplished. If one person doesn't mm -hmm. commit suicide because of it and turns their life around and that's mission accomplished, that's my mission now. Yeah, that's great. And I'm, I'm sure you have, and I'm sure you will influence more people as well. What was I going to say? The That was what I was going to say. There was a a gentleman I had on the podcast, and he was a major sponsor of this podcast, which is Philip Meese from Carnivore Bar. So he made the Carnivore Bar, which is just basically pemmican. You get dried beef and you mix it with tallow and it's just 80% yeah. calories from fat. And, and they... It is a bit different because it's a bit crunchy and grainy. And at first, it's almost like finely crushed grape nuts is stuck together with tallow. Mm -hmm. and, at, and at first, you're just, what's in my mouth right now? And uh, and because it's a new texture, it's very different. After a few of those, I was just like, I actually really liked it, especially like if they're in the refrigerator. I like, yeah. I'll take them straight out of the refrigerator. And I don't know, I actually really like them now. So I've found, I've, I've really found a taste for them. But, and that was before they sponsored me. So, they, he wanted to do that because he said the MREs that they give people yes. in the military are just so Terrible. dreadful. And he wanted, he wants this to replace that. He wants this to go, in, <laughs> which is not unheard of. These used to be the iron ration. Yeah, Napoleon, Napoleon, Napoleon fed his yeah. army with that. So it's not unheard of. It it's history. 100%. He yeah. did. And, and, you know, Bovril, have you ever come across that? No. It's Marmite, that horrible stuff. Oh, Marmite, yeah. Marmite, Vegemite, yeah. that miserable concoction bovril is like that but just from like beef and so they just basically just boil down a whole cow and it just turns into this black tar sort of paste maybe you think of it as like a, a bouillon sort of paste mm. or something like that and i i remember reading up on that and if i'm not uh misremembering it was it, that was napoleon sent someone down to argentina say you need to figure out how to feed my armies and we need to have it some compact in a can moving on along with us. And he just said, okay, I'm just going to take a herd of cows and just boil the living hell out of them and just get, and just can yeah. whatever the hell left and just send that off. And that was it. And that was Bovril that fed the Napoleonic wars, you yes. know, which were really world, they were world wars and, and cradle. And so that was, that was used then. Um, they found a cache of pemmican, as like the carnivore bar is and what the native Americans in North America would make and eat throughout the year. The British were using them as their field rations during the revolutionary war. And they found a cache of these 
50 years after the Revolutionary War in America, there's sort of some sort of bunker silo, whatever. And it was still good. Yeah. 50 years later, no refrigeration and stuff was still good. So yeah, this is historical. This is what people used to use. And we just forget this stuff. Things that yeah. people have been doing for a very long time that have stood the test of time from thought, experience, and experiment. And they said, this is what works. And it's like, screw it. We'll just completely <laughs> change everything. And, but yeah, so that's why you wanted to make the carnivore bar. Can you talk a bit about the, the MREs and, and yeah. how horrible they are? So I actually have a video on my YouTube channel because I have active duty soldiers that are carnivore that wanted me to help them go in the field and be carnivore or maintain it, right? Which you really can't do. You can do keto board, right? So mm -hmm. I did a video, I talked about call it, calling it a, a carnivore MRE video where what we, what I did was I, I went to the, I think it's called Comrade is the website that has all the MREs that are available now, the different menus and what their uh, nutritions are and nutrition values. And out of that, I could only find four entrees that were carnivore that they could eat out of. They were, they're all low fat, which is a problem, but they had the protein you need. And so we picked, I picked the four entrees said, you're gonna have to beg, borrow and steal and try to get these, find someone to supply the, or trade for these. And I think one was like, one was white chicken chunks and one was a, a tuna, which is actually like the starkest tuna in the back in a sealed envelope. And then I think another one was a burger patty, a jalapeno burger patty. And, I, and the last one I think was a, a Mexican stew. Anyway, so what you can do is you can get those and then you can eat the cheese. The cheese is processed cheese. It's going to have seed oils, but you know what? It's very low carb, two grams of carbs and a lot of protein. So you're gonna have some seed oils and fats, but what I recommend these guys do is buy some ghee that's shelf stable in a squeeze bottle. So you can get that low fat MRE entree and squeeze some ghee in there and mix it up. So you're getting your fat, right? So you're maintaining your fat levels. Also, you can bring in cans of sardines in the field, which I did. Cause when I was in the army, I actually did do some keto when I was getting ready for my record annual record PT test. And I wanted to get all, everything working right. I recognized that my body worked better on keto. So I would go keto for a few weeks. And when I was in the field, I would bring sardines and eat the heck out of them, man, because those are good for you. And so I, I certain things, I have a whole list on that video and carnivore bars are on that list. So oh, nice. <laughs> I actually have a list with links and I have a link to the carnivore bar on there because that's one of the things I recognize. I said, hey, these are only about 400 calories. So they're not a complete meal replacement and they're not cheap. But if you're in the field and you want to maintain what you got, get them and maybe buy them in bulk and get a discount or buy them with a bunch of guys, jump in and buy a big ammo can of it because I know they have those. So if you get five guys that are going to do it, go do that. So anyway, that video I do to describe that. But the MREs in general are all high sugar, high carb. Like you have to discard almost everything in the MRE. But the good news is you can trade it for good stuff like cheese, which is not great, but it's better than anything else or the or those entrees that are good. So maybe you can trade for two burger patty entrees and give away your muffin tops. And you wouldn't believe how much sugar is in this stuff. It is all sugar. They are the worst thing you can eat. And they stop you up, man. When you're in a field, you talk about constipation. You are going to get stopped up for days if you eat those things. It is, it is bad. That's what we have to live on. In fact, when we go on patrol, we would strip out a lot of that crap. And just rip them open and just take the entree and that one thing and throw them in your pack so you could feel, fit more meals in there and have more food because, well, we call it food. But then you get rid of all the junk that goes with it because there's so many things that are just drink mixes and shakes and all this crazy stuff. And it's all sugar. But it's because the government guidelines, right? Just like you go to a hospital. You go to a hospital, you have cancer. They're going to give you sugar, which is a terrible idea, right? Have a Coke and here's some pudding. And it's ridiculous, right? So... That's the government guidelines and that's what we're living in. So we got to, I tell guys that, listen, you have to be your own advocate in, for your health. You have to in, in active duty and when you get out, because you can't trust people are trained by government standards. Yeah. Philip is, as well, he was a combat medic and yeah, so he might be someone that, that would be interesting to talk to as well. I, I interviewed him as well. It was a really interesting conversation. And you can check that out and see what you think. But uh, I also, I don't know, are they able to make pemmican and bring their own food or not really? You Okay. So yes, especially, okay. So if you're just doing an FTX, which is a field exercise, which you might be in the field two to four weeks, and that's usually just training. Like you might be in Fort Hood or you might be out in some range somewhere. Yes, then for sure. So a normal operational training, like right now we're not a state of war. Yes, 100%. Troops can make their own food and bring it. You just have to be 
if you're in a Humvee, you can stash a lot of stuff or in a vehicle. If you have a vehicle, if you have access to a vehicle or know a guy in the platoon that does or a company, then you can definitely stash stuff. You can work around that. It, most people don't. They don't plan. They just go there and say, where's my food? And you give them an MRE and eat it. But the, the, what I like about the guys on my channel, they're following me, they're active duty, and they're like, hey, how am I going to do this when I go in the field? They're planning ahead. That's That tells me a lot. And yeah, so they can do that or they can, and there are recipes online. I've seen, I haven't tried it, but I've yeah. seen, have you ever tried any of those pemmican recipes? I have. Yeah, no, I've, oh. I made it. It's not too hard. Once you get, once you right. do it out, you just need to dry it out. You can dry it out in the oven, put it on the lowest heat, keep the oven door <clears> open. So it's sort of cycling air, but it's just getting out all the moisture and very thin strips of meat, probably easier to, to if you cut them thin against the grain, because when you, with, if it's with the grain there's long fibers and it's dry, it's hard as hell. And yeah. so it's hard for you, your blender to blend that up. You need a really high power blender to do that. But if you cut against the grain, but very thin and then dry them out, the fibers are already cut up. And so then you put those in a blender and just, just powder really quickly. And then you take those out and you just take the dried powdered blended dried meat. And then you mix that with some melted. So like grass fed right. tallow, you can get, get that easily in America. You get that easily on, on Amazon. It's yeah. very cheap and, and it comes back and it looks yellow. That means that's how you know that's that it's grass actually fed. grass yeah. fed and finished. So it's, it makes a difference. It's, it is better nutrition and better omega threes and a lot of other stuff as well. And then you mix that in, melt that. So it's just liquid. It doesn't mean it have to be hot as hell. And then you just mix it in together 50, 50. So the same weight mm -hmm. of dried meat and rendered tallow and that, and then you mix it all together, put it out in this little paste. You can put it out on you know, a cooking sheet and with some wax paper or whatever right. and and then just let it put it in the fridge let it harden up and it, it actually tastes good and it's it's not as crunchy as the carnivore bar it's more soft because the stuff has been powdered I just make it a bit differently and if i remember correctly three quarters of a pound is two thousand calories of perfect nutrition awesome and so you know, do you need exactly 2000 calories? Almost no one does, but whatever, <laughs> let's just use that as a benchmark. If you are, so three quarters of a pound being 2000 calories, 10 pounds of pack weight is two full weeks of perfect nutrition at 2000 calories a day. So yeah. it actually works really well. And it's, and it is cheap you know, because a carnivore bar, it's expensive to produce. Talk to Phil, like he's, he was actually losing money for a while and, uh, and selling it at a price that he's basically breaking even because he wants this out there and he wants to get out there. And if, and so it is expensive, but it's expensive to produce as well. Right. But if you're making pemmican yourself, it, you can do it much cheaper than that. That's a good option. So I'll, I'll definitely point, I'll point that out and point those vets to this picture, this video too, because they're definitely interested in maintaining a carnivore and if they're just in the field for a couple of weeks, it's no big deal. They may burn more than 2000 calories a day though. Cause when you're carrying your armor and your hydration system and your communication system and your ammo and your gun, you're carrying, like I hike with a 40 pound vest now just to keep in shape. And I used to do that when I was in the military, but when I'm in the field, it's more like 60 pounds. And then if you, you got your helmet, your boots and your, I would drink over a gallon a day and never pee for sure. <laughs> Seriously, it's weird. You're just drinking and you never have to pee. And cause you're sweating it all out and your clothes get all stiff because you're wearing the same clothes for weeks and stuff. It's nasty, but it's your body goes through some weird changes <laughs> when you're out there, but you burn a ton of calories. I'll tell you that. And we, we don't, our belts, I used to, I have a rigging belt. We call them rigging belts. It's a Velcro belt. That's what I'm wearing now because I keep losing weight so fast that I kept buying belts and having to buy new belts. And I just got, went back to my army gear and pulled my rigging belt out. And that's what I wear now all the time because it's Velcro. So I can always tighten it. No loops required. Yeah. But yeah, in the no. field, you have to do that because you start losing weight so fast that your pants be dragging. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, you were saying you're saying that about the government guidelines. So obviously, like the military has just follows it by the book, and whether that's oh. those are good guidelines or bad guidelines, they are the guidelines. And so you were saying that you know, that this the problems pro you thought coming around the Vietnam War, and that's you know in the 70s, um, and that's when a lot of this was coming out. The old fats bad, fats bad, the McGovern report in the right. late 70s, and the USDA declaration that fat and cholesterol cause heart disease and all that sort of stuff. And the food pyramid coming in around that time as well. And that obviously influenced the, the military rations as well, presumably. 
Yeah, the sea rats before that had a lot more fats and canned potted meat and everything is a lot. We don't get that anymore. That's probably much better. I'd rather eat spam. And we had spam in those meals too. So I would rather eat yeah. that than what they're offering now. And speaking of guidelines, these active duty troops, we have what's called a PHA or a physical health assessment you have to do online. And just to make sure you're following their guidelines and you're not, and you're healthy it's to keep your active duty status and to get to schools and everything. You always have to jump through these gates. These guys have to lie about their diet because if they were putting down what they were eating, they would be like disqualified from a lot of promotion <laughs> going to schools because, you know, their PHA would, they'd fail it. So they're telling me like, yeah, we're just putting down what they want us to say. <laughs> That's not what we're eating. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> do it. Do what yeah. you got to do, man. They'll play their yeah. games. We'll play ours. We're good. But, yeah. but guess exactly. what? These guys, they did their first PT test. And they crushed it. They're, they're, they were nervous going in. Hey, I don't know about this. I'm not feeling it. I'm like, just trust the process, man. Go out there and hit your numbers. And he went out there and just, he just crushed it. He came back and said, dude, I crushed that thing. I'm like, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Once you test your body after you've been on this diet, like I did today, sprinting, it, you just feel athletic. I, I don't know how to put it. See, you've always been athletic. So you didn't get that transition like I did where I went being athletic, then downhill for decades and then coming to come back, it's, yeah, I'm back. It's amazing. No, but when I kept working out and things like that, but I, I wasn't playing rugby at the same level I was before. I just didn't have time to. And then, but then at 38, all of a sudden I felt like I was 22 again. And I was just like, I'm definitely going back to play because I just felt so good. Right. And I hadn't felt like that in a, in, since I was 25 and right. came off and came off the diet. So even playing at in, in the super league and doing all representative rugby and all that sort of stuff and playing in England, I, or really the latter half of playing in England when I slipped off the diet, it, that was, I, I felt very different. I could still work really hard and get in shape, but as soon as I stopped working out, I got out of shape really quickly and I, I put on fat and I lost muscle and, and I had to work really hard to get back in shape. And it was always a, just a constant struggle against entropy it was my body just wanted to just keep breaking down and breaking down and and i had to just fight to keep it together and i could but when i'm eating properly and what i now know as properly i don't have right. i don't have any of that problem my body doesn't break down at all and i just i'm able to maintain without working out when i work out i get in much better shape i feel much better but i never get out of shape that's the crazy thing i can get in better shape <laughs> And I can lose some of that edge, but I never get out of shape completely. I'm never, uh, I, I don't put on a lot of fat and lose a lot of muscle. My muscles stay, you know, strong and toned and I stay pretty low body fat percentage. I will start working out. My muscles get bigger. They get more toned and I get lower body fat percentage, but they never go down past a certain point that a lot of people would consider you would need steroids to get to in the first place. And I don't even work out. And right. so that's the sort of the crazy thing. Now I worked out for years, several hours a day to get that base structure. And right. then now this just maintains up to a certain level, but, and I know people would say that I, the whole steroid thing, because I've taken pictures when I first started Instagram started becoming more public about all this. I posted pictures of myself with my shirt off or, or whatever. And people are, oh, that's steroids, that's steroids. I'm like, I was in quarantine for a month. I didn't even go to the gym. So that's me not working out. Yeah. And that, and that was, oh, that's, that must be steroids or something like that. I wasn't even, I wasn't even doing pushups. So that's just how your body maintains itself when you're eating properly. You don't need anything else. Are you you looking when I have, sorry, go on. Oh, I say when you look at animals in the wild. They're, yeah. they're lean. My dog is, my dog's a carnivore too. He is muscle and lean just all the time. So yeah, yeah. same thing. And, and animals in the zoo because animals in the wild, they're, wild, they're working out all the time. They're always running and chasing yeah. and all that. Animals in the zoo aren't. And I, I've yet to see a fat zebra at the zoo and, yeah. and they're just standing there. They just stand there all day. There's nowhere for them to go. They're not running around and being active. And, and then people will say, well, that's because they're feeding, they're getting fed a perfect diet. Yes, what they are designed to eat. And so if we do the same thing, then we're going to get, we're going to get similar results. And I, I can tell you that's, those are the results I get. Yeah. There's an anabolic aspect to this diet. I can tell because 
just the instantaneous change in your muscles and your when you work out it's instant it's i've done creatine in the past i've done protein powder i've done different programs none of them are like this this is so far exceeding any of that performance wise where you can just work out like a couple of weeks and see muscle immediately wow it's like not it's not going to take a four week or six week or eight week it's like first 10 days you're going to start noticing like muscle coming on it's immediate it's pretty awesome yeah yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and I mean, people tone up and they feel better just eating this way. And then if they work out, they get amazing results. That was the thing too. These guys are worried about their, their fitness and fitness tests and things like that. They're like, what's going to happen? Don't, I'm going to need carbs. I'm not going to be able to do this. And then they will actually yeah. do it and they blow it out of the water. It's so funny. The people that say, oh, you, that's bullshit. You have to, you need carbs in order to whatever. It's all bro science. Like I've broken down in many videos, the actual biochemistry of this and professors of medicine and sports science, like professor Tim Noakes down in South Africa and right. Dr. Paul Mason, who's sport, sports medicine doctor over in Sydney and professor Peter Brunkner, all these people that like, break down the science. I've broken down the science. Wow. That's, and they call us bro science. And then they say, oh, no, this is how you have to do it because my mommy told me. And uh, okay, so we've got bro science. You've got mommy science. Only difference is ours is right. And and that's the thing is when people do this and they try this and their athletic performance goes through the roof, their athlete, their exercise potential goes crazy exactly as predicted by us and exactly counter to what the detractors would say. It's pretty telling. And the, these people that are just saying, oh, no, that can't work, that can't work are people that have just never tried it, but then people try it and they're really nervous about it. And then they do it and go, I had no idea. I had no idea. Yep. That's exactly the conversation I had with those soldiers, by the way. They were like, oh, uh, yeah. they were like, uh, we're tempted to take carbs the night before. It was the night before. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, dude, just trust it, man. Just don't do that. Just trust it. Cause if you do that, you're going to throw away everything you just did. I just yeah. trust us. So like, all right, chief. I, I was a chief warner. They call me chief. Like, all right, chief, we're going to trust you. And then to get that yeah. text that morning, Oh, and yeah. so here's the deal. On top of that, I was at my son's cr uh, cross country match. My son plays soccer and cross country. He's 14. And he went carnivore in the summer because he saw me healing nice. up and losing weight. And I didn't want to force him into the diet. Right. So I'm like, I told him what I'm doing. I explained it. I explained the theory behind it and discussed it with him. And he just watched me and he saw my ankle heal up. I started being able to do things I wasn't able to do a long time. And then he said to me one day at summer, he's like, dad, uh, he had a, a lingering in, uh, foot injury from soccer that was bothering him. He had to wear uh, like plates and his, I don't know what they are, and his insoles, inserts for shoes, or you he, get inflammation. So he's going to heal my foot. I was like, I don't know some, but it can't hurt. So he went carnivore and strict, and it was great. And then had a terrible time for six weeks, like no energy. And he's like, I don't know, dad, I feel terrible. And then all of a sudden it switched and he's fine. Yeah. His last three races, he set PRs each race and he placed his this his first race he actually placed fifth which is great for his team yeah. that's the first time he's ever placed so he's seeing he's not he's knocked two minutes off his time on a two mile wow. that's pretty awesome and two uh, mile but, that's really yeah, good yeah. Yeah, yeah he's running 14 14 minute two miles now so he's at seven minutes nice. and he's only 14 he's not in high school he's in junior high he's in middle school so he's mm. doing good and but i got that text from those troops when he was winning his race. So it was like a great day. I was like, man, my son got a new PR and these troops are like crushing the PT test. It was a great day. So just it's, yeah, already I can tell Mission Carnivore and my YouTube channel. I never, ever thought about a podcast or a YouTube channel ever. But the only reason I did it is because I had such good results. I told my neighbor who's a veteran and he did it and he got great results. And then I told my brother, my sister, they did it. They got great results. Everyone around me was getting great results and a friend and then that friend told someone else I'd never met and they got great results. And that got back to me. And I was like, wow, that's like a ripple effect. What if I'm expanded this a little bit? Because obviously I'm influencing these people around me. What if I made a larger influence pool and see if we could help more people? And that's why I just launched into YouTube and uh, then started the podcast. And it's been great. Yeah. The emails, how it is, the emails I get are just so encouraging and awesome. It's humbling and it's really exciting. Cause I just look forward to every day now. Okay. I want to, and that's another thing in, on carnivore is my brain function. I became, I had gotten to the point where I was resigned to living the life I was living and declining the rest of my life, really just going in a downhill to, and to, to where my dad is right now. It was not, he's older and he's like suffers pain and all that. I'm just like, that's where I'm going to go to. I'm going to be just a 78 year old or 80 year old guy, barely making it. And, but now I feel like 
I see Maggie jump and hearing her jumping over fences and wrestling bulls and stuff. I'm like, that's where I'm going to yeah. be, man. I'm going to be out there running sprints and and push ups and doing stuff. And I'm planning things for a future that I wasn't before before carnivore. I, so that switch in my brain really prompted me to talk to other veterans. Hey, listen, this is this could be a game changer. It really could be. It could be a super game changer. So anyway, that's my whole my my whole mission carnivore thing. It just came up organically from my experience. Yeah, that's great. I, I think it's, I think it's really nice that, that you and others are making platforms. I was in the same position thing. Is it worth me doing a channel? Is it worth me doing videos? Is that adding to anything? Is that helping people? There's already people saying things that I like and generally agree with. And especially Dr. Baker and Ken Berry and, and these people, I was just like, these guys are saying the things that I want people to say. And pointing out the things that I want pointed out, is it worth me doing that? And something that I found out was that really early on was that you can say very similar things, but you have a very, you have a slightly different take on it. And, mm -hmm. and maybe you have new information that, that they don't necessarily have, or you think about it in a slightly different way. And so you present it in a different way. And that speaks to other people differently. And I've had enough people reach out to me and say, Hey, I've seen other carnivore proponents and, and it made sense what they were saying, but I never was really interested in it until I saw your video on X, Y, or Z. And it, and it really, it made sense to me when you said that and I said, okay, I'm going to try that now. And I'm really glad I did because I had all these benefits. And so that's the thing is that you are going to have your own take on things. You're going to have a unique perspective and unique information. And that's going to speak to other people that may not actually get the message in other ways. And so I think it's, it is really important and it's really great that you've done that. I'm sure that you've gotten a lot of messages from people and, and people that your, your target audience are people that really need help. And so that's really good. I'm really glad that you're out there doing that. Yeah. I've gotten a lot of emails for, and correspondence and messages from veterans from across the world, Australia, UK, everywhere, Ireland, and then Canada, but then I also get law enforcement. I got law enforcement from the Netherlands and places. I'm thinking, I wow, I can't believe they're watching it over there. And yeah. that's cool. But yeah, so we do each have our group of people that we can relate to or people relate to us, I guess is really what it is. So someone just sees me and says, Hey, I like his style because he was military and his delivery is a little different and he knows what MREs are or whatever. That's cool. Whatever. But if someone, you know, yeah. So if someone wants something else, they can go somewhere else. Everyone's got different things to offer, I think, for the most part. And so that's the plan. Yeah, and it is It is pretty awesome. It's been, I've only been doing it for a month now, so I'm new. I'm, I, this is my sixth sixth week, I think. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's exciting. I really am excited to see where it goes and and meet all these people. I'm just making lots of great friends online, and it's pretty exciting. So I got a couple of questions I'd like to ask you, if you wouldn't mind, though. Sure. Yeah. Can you talk about the types of mental health conditions that are shown to improve with carnivore that we know improve? Yeah, the distinction should be made that it's not just carnivore diets that that have been shown to improve things. It's ketogenic diets as, as a whole. And so you can do a ketogenic diet without specifically being on a carnivore diet. I think that's the best kind of ketogenic diet. And I think that's why ketogenic diets work so well for people is because it's getting you closer to your biological design, to our biologically appropriate uh, diet. And that's what a, a carnivore diet is. All the best evidence shows that humans are carnivores. We've been apex predators throughout our entire existence and apex predators are definitionally carnivores. And so all animals, all life on earth have, it has a specific prescribed diet that they have to, that, that is optimal for them. And the same is true for us as well, as well as every other you know, living organism. So I think that that's why keto does so well is that it gets you closer to our biological design, which is carnivore, which is also keto. So the studies that are done with diet are specifically with keto. So it's not, it doesn't have to be carnivore, but as professor Chris Palmer said, he was doing carnivore for a long time. And that's absolutely, you know, part of the program. You can do it as a carnivore, or you can include some non-carbohydrate and sugar ridden vegetables and things like that. If you want to, I don't because they have defense chemicals, which are yeah. plants designed. They're, they're stationary. They don't move. They can't run away or fight back, but they are also 99% of life on earth. So they are the dominant organisms and they cannot be defenseless. And so while animals can run away or fight back, plants can't. And so they have to have other defenses, which are toxin 
This is why you go out in the field and you run out of your MREs and your carnivore bars and can't eat any random plants. Most of them will make you very sick or even kill you. And while it's hard to catch and kill an animal, especially big bastards like a mammoth that we were eating for a million plus years, once you get it down, the meat is safe. The meat is nothing but wholesome and nutritious. Whereas a plant is not hard to track down, but it is deadly poisonous and that's how it protects itself. So the the studies are done with keto diets in particular, but people such as Professor Chris Palmer and Dr. Georgia Ede have done amazing work and they've shown that basically any mental health issue can be affected and improved or even put into full remission with a keto carnivore diet. So depression, major depression, anxiety, OCD, bipolar, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, ADHD, and even autism. Autism seems to be a mitochondrial metabolic issue as well. And that has to do with misdevelopment of the brain cells. And so you, it doesn't work the way it's designed to work. And there are also nutritional deficiencies as well. They can bring about autism and a misdevelopment of the neurons as well, such as a carnitine deficiency. Most people say, that, well, carnitine is, is, an, is a non-essential a non-essential uh, amino acid, uh, but that's only true for some people because only 70% of people make a sufficient amount of uh, carnitine. Other people have to get it from their diet. It does not exist in plants. You can only get it from meat. And so if you're uh, mm -hmm. vegans and vegetarians, and they're significantly reducing or eliminating out the meat that they're eating or that, that's available to eat and their kids are deficient, they can develop this form of autism. That was shown by Texas A&M, University of Texas A&M, and that there are much higher rates of uh, autism in, in vegan and uh, vegetarian households. Professor Palmer also showed that you can actually undo a lot of the, the effects of autism. Even as an adult, people with autism as an adult, when they go into a keto carnivore diet, they improve dramatically. There are entire treatment groups around the world that treat autism at any age with ketogenic diets. And, and it improves, it helps them. And so this is in the literature. If you get it as young as possible. So if anybody has a family member or a child with autism, this is important because a, it will, it will help improve their life and their function at any age, even if they're 90, but if they're still developing, if their brain is still developing, they have time to undo that misdevelopment and they can actually start making more and more properly formed neurons that and, and essentially not have autism anymore after that. And so that's something that is very, it's exciting that you yeah. can actually address something like this. <clears throat> I actually saw a, a documentary. Another thing I do on my channel is I do movie reviews for uh, diet documentaries. So like mm -hmm. the fat, a documentary, and I basically review the movie and then tell a carnivore like my what what's good in it that's carnivore and what may not be good and then whether this would be a good thing to introduce to a family member or somebody who's not supportive or is supportive just to show them what you're doing so i and one of the movies i watched was the magic pill i don't know if you've ever seen that but they actually I have an yet, but I, I plan to yeah they have an autistic girl in there that she goes on a keto diet and they show them the videos there. You can't deny mm -hmm. what happens. You see the difference in her behavior after I think six weeks. And at first, like she will not eat the food. Like she'd be, and autistic children can be very difficult. And she was super difficult. And they show the problems they had trying to get her to eat that. But they're like, the doctor, she'll get hungry. She will eat. And they, they had to go through hell. But when she got hungry, she did eat it. And then man, it's like the light bulb came on. She changed completely in front of your eyes on camera. So it's worth watching. We're checking that one out for that part, if nothing else. Yeah, definitely. I will check that out. And yeah, it, it's amazing. I've seen it help people. I've done interviews with people that I had no idea had autism, Jonathan Griffiths. And we were talking everything normal. We're talking about bodybuilding. He's a professional bodybuilder in the UK. And he said, I, and, and autism just came up in conversation. And he said, he's actually, I have autism. <laughs> and uh, I was just like, I would have never guessed that. And he said that a year ago before he went on carnivore, he would not have been able to have the conversation that we were having at that moment. And, hmm. and that had made such a huge difference and impact on his life.
the mental health as well. It's, it can be difficult, very difficult. It's if, if you are able to do it and you're able to affect that change is well worth the effort to try that with your kid. If you can, it's difficult, but if you can do, I mean, you, especially when kids are young, you control what comes into that house and you hopefully there's something that they'll eat. But if you fast, you, your insulin drops low and, and it has similar effects to having a ketogenic diet and just not eating carbohydrates because you're also not eating carbohydrates, right? And, and again, if they get hungry, they're going to eat. And that's, it's hard as a parent because you're just like, you're seeing your child really upset and you feel like they're suffering and it feels cruel, but it's, it actually works out and it works out really well in their favor and in their benefits. So if people are able to, I've never had to do that. I, you know, I haven't been in a situation where I've needed to do that. So I can't begin to imagine how difficult that can be, but I do know a lot of parents who have done this. I do know entire treatment groups that do this for all of their autistic patients and it works. It really helps. Yeah. And that's exactly what was shown on that video, which was great to see because I think it's a good example. If someone is considering it, they can watch that and see how that, how the results were worth it. Right. And it shows that, but at first you're like cringing. Ooh, that's tough. Cause mm, that, if yeah. that's your kid, you don't have kids yet, but I do. And when I had that kid, I'm not any pushover or anything, but you don't want your kid to be like suffering. Right. And it looks like she's suffering, but she's not really, you know, is she really, she's just not eating. That's not suffering. <laughs> yeah. and, and not eating for a day yeah. or so. Yeah. That's you all know, it was. Yeah. We look, we all have that's fasting <laughs> even very similar. So yeah. Fasting is very healthy. This is in most yeah. cultures and traditions and religions. They fast for periods of time and it's, <clears> it actually shows it's very healthy and it's good for you. And it can just be a bit uncomfortable, but it's not going to harm them. And even very slender people, unless you're completely emaciated and on death's door, like you've got weeks of fat and energy available to you before you, you run into trouble and start catabolizing your own muscle tissue. You just run on your own fat. So it's, yeah, it's, it seems worse than it is. And it actually will benefit them in the long run. And actually even the short run, like it will make them better when they just avoid these things that damage their brain and the functionality of uh, their body and brain. Yeah. Cause that's definitely going to, kids are so resilient and young people, it, mm -hmm. they can eat, they can get away with eating foods that may not be optimal and still mm -hmm. perform at a high level. Like yeah. Dr. Saladino, right? He's mm -hmm. in great shape. He's young. He eats some things that are, I would say questionable, but I, I and people are like, well, you can't argue with the blood work. I'm like, yeah, let's see when he's 57 and he's been laid up in six weeks with an injury and he comes and tries to come back, see what happens then. Cause I, I guarantee you, you keep adding poisons is like a cup filling up and then it overflows and then all these symptoms start coming out. Right. And I think that's that young people have a lot more resilience and they can get away with eating things that aren't great. I still, my son, I still give him whole milk with dinner every now and then he can handle that. He's an athlete. He's in great shape. He did lose 10 pounds though. when he went carnivore. It was amazing. I didn't think he could, but he, and I looked mm -hmm. at him, he, he just leaned up. He, he had what I call gamer butt a little bit from playing games too much, maybe. And he just like, looks like an athlete now, like a track athlete. So it's pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. With, with Dr. Saladino, predominantly what he eats is meat. Right. You know? And so, and whole foods. Know, yeah, yeah, exactly. And he's cutting out all this other crap mm. and compared to just everyone else on earth, like he's yeah. eating great. Is it the best that you can ever do? I, right. I don't think so. I think that what I'm doing is the best you could ever do, which is why I'm doing it, but he's doing so much better than anybody else. And, and he works out a lot. And so that can also help as well. So I think right. that you're still, even if, you know, just as long as you're moving towards the direction of eating a lot more meat and eating a lot less garbage. It, it's going to be really beneficial to you. Now, if you're suffering with mental health issues and autism and those sorts of things, I really do think that, that getting rid of the carbohydrates is really important yeah. because that has just been shown time and time again in clinical studies and humans, that's really important to, to get rid of those things. And that improves mitochondrial health and autophagy and all these sorts of things. And if you're in otherwise good health and so on, and you want to eat some fruit every now and then, and you feel fine doing that, go for it. A lot of people don't. A lot of people eat the fruit or the honey and they don't feel great and they come off of it and they feel better. Great. Yeah. Some people feel fine. Don't have a problem. I don't care what people eat. I really don't care. I just right. don't care 
what people need, as long as that's their choice and they're doing something that they want and they understand. I just want people to understand that there's a different argument on what's healthy. And just so they know that and understand that, they can do whatever the hell they want. If you understand that smoking and drinking is bad for you, but you choose to do it, fine, go for it. I, I don't care. I'm very libertarian in that regard. I, I'm, I want people to be able to make their own decisions. I just don't want them to smoke and drink because their doctor told them, no, it's really good. You have to drink at least a liter of vodka a day and you know, smoke a pack of cigarettes or else you're going to get heart disease. I think that's insane. That sort of idea of, of us eating something is completely opposite to our biological design. I think that that being told that we're supposed to eat that is is really foolhardy and dangerous. And so I don't, I, that's all I want. But if you choose to do that, go for it. But some people will go down eat a bunch of fruit and honey and things like that. And, but they come from a, a, a past of carb addiction mm -hmm. and issues with addiction to food and, and those sorts of cravings. And that just opens up that can of worm. They start eating more fruit and more honey and more fruit and more honey. And then they start eating bread and pasta and pizza. And six months later, they're drinking sodas and pizza on the couch again. And they've lost all their, all the ground that they gained. And, and I've seen that and I've seen people do it. And I even talked to Dr. Saladino about that. And he said, he's just, yeah, I still haven't figured that one out on how to prevent people from doing that. And it's not everyone, but right. the, you know, if you recognize that's you, probably yeah. a good idea to avoid it. But if you want to try some fruit or try some this, fine. See how it makes you feel. See what it makes you do. And you can try not doing it and just eating just the meat. See how it makes you feel. And, and just you pick for yourself which one you like best. Yeah, I reintroduced coffee a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, I think maybe a week ago. And at first I was like, okay, cool, great. And I didn't get sore. I was waiting for your story where I started getting sore. I was like, okay, that didn't happen to me. That's good. But I started getting a tickle in my throat and having to clear my throat <clears throat> like a lot during my videos. So my last mm -hmm. two weeks of videos, I was doing <clears throat> like that a lot. And, I, and then I realized, oh my gosh, that's ever since I did coffee. That mm -hmm. So two days ago, I stopped coffee. Guess what? I don't have to clear my throat anymore. So Whatever it was, I don't know. It could be a reaction to the mold or whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm just not going to do coffee anymore. So today I had my cup of, of beef stock or bone broth with a little, I put a little smoked salt in there and a butter and I just heat it up and that gives me a little bitterness. It's good. And that's my coffee replacement. And after being in the military so many years, I was totally addicted to coffee and I'm a carb addict too. So I can't do sugar either. And what I do, people are get very dogmatic about this diet. I, I've, I've learned being, I'm single. So when I date, I don't usually bring up religion, politics, or diet at first mm -hmm. because until I order, right? Because, and then when I order, I'm like, hey, do you want my sides? Because I'm just getting meat. Anyway, so the the whole thing about the dogma is I tell people on like on my Facebook forum and stuff, hey, listen, if you're going to correct someone, that's cool because you can tell them what's right. But the way to do it is just say, hey, like the best practices for the optimum results is this. You can do what you want to do, but eating honey is definitely not one of the best practices of being a carnivore. And if you put it that way, it's not, you're not slamming them. You're not saying, I can't believe you're going to eat honey. That's stupid. That's not carnivore. It's like that. Tone it down. Just give them some advice. Say, listen, yeah, I don't do that because I'm addicted to sugar and I know it makes me crave things. So I don't have any sweeteners and that's the best practice for carnivore. And if you put it that way, I think we can be a lot more yeah. civil and have better discussions because on, online it gets pretty crazy sometimes. Where people get like on both yeah. sides of the coin. I can't believe how mean these people are. I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. There's a lot of dogma out here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you get a lot of, key, you know, keyboard warriors. who just get pissed. Oh, this is bullshit. And normally if you, if you have to actually look at somebody and talk to them in the same room, it's a yeah. more civil discussion. And I wish we could keep it that way as well. But Larry, unfortunately I have another meeting I have to get to, okay. but it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Can you tell people where they can find you in your YouTube channel and all that good stuff? Sure. My YouTube channel is at carnivore soldier and I have a web page has all my links on it, carnivore .com. And then of course I have the, the podcast going, which is the Carniv uh, mission carnivore podcast. So those are my connection points. Thanks, Dr. JV. And you want to give yours? So people, you're pretty famous. So you probably don't need to. <laughs> famous. <laughs> but, uh, In the carnivore community. Yeah. Okay. But that's uh, very niche. But uh, yeah, yeah, I have a podcast, just Anthony Chafee, MD. And so Chafee spells C-H-A-D. And that's the same as my Instagram is just Anthony Chafee, MD. And then my podcast is just called The Plant-Free MD, just talking about 
carnivore and, and why it's important to not only eat more meat, but specifically exclude plants and other sorts of things. And yeah, and that, that was great. I'll put all your links in there and I'll put the link for Professor Chris Palmer and his and the interview I did with him for people that want to look at that and who haven't seen it. And, and if, yeah, if we want to do something like this again, that would be great. And uh, yeah. yeah, pleasure to, I appreciate pleasure it. to talk to you. You too, Anthony. Talk to you later.